idea why for eight years I was my own worst enemy. Around the age of 10, I began to question everything. And by the time I was 14, this questioning led to severe depression. Not only because disillusionment is a painful process, but also because I struggled to fit in, to understand people. I wanted to talk about heaven and hell and about the notion of living forever and about why all of the adults in my life claimed that they strived for happiness every day, but none of them seemed to be happy. So by the time I was a teen, I was seen by most of my peers as, well, a little weird. And I tried to start controlling every social interaction to try to forcibly make myself talk like and look like and act like my peers. But people are quite good at detecting falseness, so this just made me look all the stranger. This all led to a horribly mangled self-image. And on top of that, I realized that along the way, I had never developed an internal sense of self-worth. I also had no sense of control in my life. I was a victim in everything, and I couldn't control anything. The world was just kind of happening to me, something that psychologists call an externalized locus of control. Coupled with severe depression and a highly volatile temperament, or and as I like to put it, my emotions hitting me like a freight train, I began to cut. You see, when you're sad and angry and feel out of control, you want to express that pain. And when you don't value your own life more than other people, you target yourself. And something about that physical pain really does make the emotional pain go away, at least for a while. So then I began to, play, or I began to try to lose weight and began to play sports. And you couldn't cut when you played sports. Your arms were exposed in a cross-country tank, your thighs when you were in a one-piece swimsuit, and your stomach when it was so blistering hot during track practice you wore nothing but a sports bra and a pair of shorts. But that was okay, because I had found another way to express my self-destructiveness. I was very resourceful. I began to lose weight, and when I did, it felt great. People began to validate me for my physical appearance, for my athletic ability, I started to feel more socially composed, more graceful, and even more emotionally stable, until I disappointed my coach, until I wasn't peeling seconds off my PR at every race. Then that same feeling of frustration, that same sense of worthlessness came right back. So I began to practice until I fainted. I began to try to lose even more weight because I found out that if you lost one pound of fat, you could pull three seconds off of one mile. You see the trend here, right? I won't go into any more history, or my, any more of my self-destructive history. The point I'm trying to convey is that it seems like the same underlying pain just kept finding new ways to express itself. That's what I realized about a year ago when I received a grant from the University of North Georgia to conduct a research study on this topic. I had already been doing research for the university, and I had already honed in on eating disorders with the intent to find the missing piece of the puzzle in ED pathology. What I realized along the way was that it wasn't one piece that was missing. Half the puzzle was gone. So, to be more intimately acquainted with the disorder, I began to read through my own writing hundreds of pages of prose, poetry, and personal essays that I had written throughout the years to see if I could notice any trends. And what I found was astounding. The same five words kept showing up in my writing during every period that I engaged in self-destructive behavior, regardless of what it was. No control, overwhelmed, pain, sadness, and most commonly, worthless. I translated these into the following four psychological factors. Externalized locus of control, volatile temperament, presence of depressive symptoms, and low, externalized, fragile, or in my case, all of the above, sense of self-worth. Currently, eating disorders are seen as isolated from other disorder, mental disorders. The very definition of an eating disorder explains the things that typify, or we might say separate, eating disorders from other mental illnesses. This is where you look at me and go, well, duh, that's what a de definition does. But just hear me out. The dictionary defines an eating disorder in the following way. 
any range of psychological disorders characterized by abnormal and disturbed eating habits. Well, that's somewhat vague. So let's look at a specific eating disorder, say anorexia. A psychological and possibly life-threatening eating disorder defined by an extremely low body weight relative to stature, a low BMI, extreme and needless weight loss, illogical fear of weight gain, and a distorted perception of self-image and body. The problem with this definition is that larger society, such as possibly you in the audience, your family, your neighbors, the media, and even a lot of counselors focus in on these symptoms and these symptoms alone. You see a person who has an eating disorder, someone who has some strange, illogical fear of gaining weight, someone who's vapid, shallow, some whiny rich brat who can't stand to gain a pound, as I've had said to my face before. This leaves people who suffer from eating disorders thinking, you just don't get it, do you? It's not about food or weight. <laughs> not really, not at all. So what is an eating disorder, and how can we reconceptualize it? That was the first step in my research, and I came up with this hypothesis. In a grander scope, the researchers propose that eating disorders are a type of self-destructiveness related to other forms, such as substance abuse and self-mutilation, that stem from a single condition. We assert that all forms of self-destructiveness have a similar, possibly identical, biological basis that is then mediated through similar psychological factors. The resulting multiple varied channels of expression thus lies in differing social correlates. Now, to explain that in plain English, this hypothesis is saying that currently we see self-harm, substance abuse, and eating disorder all as entirely separate mental disorders. But maybe they're all just differing forms of the same disorder, self-destructiveness, that's finding different ways to express itself. To make this a little clearer, I have a diagram. I'm going to give you an example. Say we have a 21-year-old male and a 16-year-old female. We'll call them John and Jane, respectively. They both have genetic mutation A and genetic mutation B that's associated with self-destructiveness. They also have the same, more or less, psychological profile. But John is a musician and is in, the music, is in a scene where experimenting with drugs is condoned and sometimes even promoted. And Jane is a typical young girl for her age. She lives in an existence highly saturated by media influence. She reads beauty magazines, she watches mainstream television, she is constantly pressured to strive for thinness. With the right event that exposes the individual's emotional vulnerability, self-destructiveness can manifest and in differing forms. For John, it may be substance abuse. For Jane, an eating disorder. So, that would mean that the social environment is really just serving as the means of, or the, it determines the means of expression. And while it and genetic factors are important, this hypothesis hints that we should focus on the mediating psychological factors. And we can do this through cognitive behavioral therapy. It's one of my favorite things. So these ideas all work together for a few reasons, and you'll kind of get the gist of cognitive behavioral therapy as I go along. First of all, environment, and like social considerations, and genetics alone are not enough. Many, many people within society, many more than we'd probably like to admit, experiment with drugs. They live in a bi-negative culture, they have access to objects which they could readily harm themselves, but they never develop a disorder associated with any of these things. And by the same token, just because someone has a genetic predisposition does not mean it will ever express itself as an actual condition. That's important because I know a lot of people worry about that, so let me re-emphasize that. Mutations associated with a disease does not directly translate into the development of that disease. So genetics and environment alone are not enough. They have to interact on the individual's psychology, making, in my mind, a person's psychology the best point of attack for future interventions. A second point to consider is that this is a reconceptualization of these disorders that might lead to ther have therapeutic benefits. Therapeutic benefits being a higher, relapse, or a higher recovery rate and a lower relapse rate. This change in perception would lead someone to see self-destructiveness as the root disorder and the eating disorder or the self-harm or the substance abuse as a mere symptom. 
It would help us focus in on the underlying psychological issues that are really driving the person to this action. A third thing to consider is the fact that this approach is autonomy building versus autonomy crushing, which I personally, as I said before, I felt I had no control in my life. I think is essential because a lot of therapies nowadays, they take away the person's sense of autonomy. And this, the therapy that I would hope to develop, would say, you can reshape your entire mindset by reshaping your thoughts, because that leads to an actual reshaping of your neural circuitry. By changing your thoughts, you actually can change your biology, and that has been proven. You can look that up. <laughs> Unless you would like to give references. But <laughs> so anyway. Um, and then a fourth thing to consider is the fact that comorbidity rates, or how frequently two disorders occur, is high between all three disorders. So we could say that a person struggles with anorexia and alcoholism, but wouldn't it be worthwhile to consider that maybe they have the same disorder, but that it's just finding multiple ways to express itself? Now, this approach doesn't work with all mental disorders. Some really are more physiological. Some are the result of legitimate, permanent chemical imbalances and or irreversible degeneration. I'm not trying to argue here that you can, you can think your way out of schizophrenia. But with these trio of disorders, I do think that is possible because I think they're the result of cognitive distortions and that they're used as a maladaptive coping mechanism. Which brings us to my second hypothesis. Oh, it's already up. The researcher proposes that varying forms of self-destructiveness serve as an adaptive coping mechanism to the, to the individual, allowing them to blunt the pain of an unmet higher need by causing a deficit and a lower need. Now, to break this down, we need to talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Some of you might have already heard about this, but I'll go ahead over and go over it briefly. The gist of it is, is that you begin at the lowest level of need satisfaction and then slowly progress upward throughout the lifespan until you self-actualize. Self so you begin with your base physical needs for food, water, sex, and then your needs for safety and security. Once these basic needs are met, you can move on to your need for love and belonging, for esteem, and finally, for self-actualization. Now, Maslow focused on those who he saw as the best of society, those who had self-actualized already, those who are happy, healthy, highly intrinsically motivated, and bent on making a contribution to the world. But, and most of his followers who have come after him have also followed in this tradition. But I think that we can spin this theory on its head and apply it to clinical psychology, which could be said to be dealing with people who are struggling the most in society. Because a key concept of his theory is that one cannot advance to a higher level of need satisfaction, or in other words, cannot focus on advancing to a higher need, level of need satisfaction until a lower need is met. So what I'm suggesting is that maybe Someone can intentionally begin these self-destructive behaviors and cause a need deficit on a lower level, and by doing so, they achieve emotional blunting of an unmet higher need. I can tell you from personal experience, it's hard to contemplate much when you're literally physiologically starving. And every time that loss of control event comes into your mind, that creeping sense of self-hatred, that rejection from a loved one, that's when you work out for five hours, when you count your calories for the 10th time that day, when you purge. And after a while, all you really do feel is the pain in your legs and the pain in your stomach and the burning in your throat. Everything else really does go numb. So what you have then is an extremely powerful, albeit maladaptive, coping mechanism that allows one to blunt the pain of an, an emotional need that has not been met while at the same time externalizing it and expressing it, which is important to a lot of these people. So, to summarize this all up, my research is attempting to take an Occam's razor approach and create a unified, simplified theory for the development, maintenance, and tr treatment of self-harm, substance abuse, eating disorders, and general need thwarting behavior. I'm not saying that we throw out genetic studies or discard environmental factors or get rid of the special considerations for each of these disorders, such as the physiological addiction that does come with substance abuse. I'm simply saying that we investigate into the psychological and really try to deal with the underlying needs that these people have and why they don't feel like they're being satisfied, so that 
relapse is less likely, manifestation of, in, of the disorder in a differing form is less likely, and recovery is more likely. For substance abuse, they won't even give you recovery rates. All they have are relapse rates because it's that common. For every, they differ depending on each disorder, but for every statistic I've seen, they generally run between 50%, about the same odds as if you flipped a coin. So, I also propose that we consider the adaptiveness of self-destructiveness. Now, as far as you people in the audience go and everyone watching goes, all I want you to go walk away from, all I want you to have when you walk away from this is I just want you to have some of your previous notions regarding this disorder, these disorders challenged. I want you to have some kind of insight into a loved one who might be struggling with alcoholism or might be struggling with self-harm or, or an eating disorder. And maybe I'll even give you insight into your own self-harming behavior. Because even if you have a disorder, you personally suffer from one, it doesn't mean you have complete understanding of self. Like I said, I had no idea why for eight years I kept constantly tripping myself up and why once I had weeded out the big issues, I kept finding self-destructive tendencies in my platonic relationships, my romantic relationships, and even in my education and career. It was devastating to my entire life up until the age of 22. And I was very lucky to have professors who put up with me and worked with me. But I'm not saying that this research is even applicable to every self-harming individual. The research is still out on that. I don't know yet. But what I'm talking about here today is the understanding of myself that I came to, and I hope that at least one person can benefit from it. Thank you.